distribution in a sense. Oh, okay, thank you. In the sense that um, the parts of the input that are shown, not masked, are used to fill in the other parts that are missing from the image. So you have to know how to extend certain parts of the signal or how to extrapolate and fill in the gaps in the image. Uh, so the idea is that the GLOM architecture in this paper could be trained as a masked autoencoder. So transformers, um, I'm sure everyone here has at least heard of transformers by this point. Uh, probably many people in the audience have worked with them or are uh, familiar with the architecture. The fundamental idea behind the transformer architecture is attention. So uh, to summarize what's going on with the attention mechanism, we want to update the representation for object I with information from object J based on, on how similar the two objects are to each other or how maybe how relevant the two objects are to each other. Uh, in transformers, this is typically done using query key value attention. Uh, and the idea behind query key value attention is that the objects act differently when they're used as indices versus when they're used as values. Um, so if I have uh, some words in a sentence, uh, I saw cat on mat, right? Or I saw the cat on the mat. Um, the relevance between cat and mat, uh, we might want to transform cat and transform mat into uh, queries and keys so that we can calculate the relevance scores. But then when we update the representation for cat with the representation for mat, uh, we may not want to use those query and key representations. We might want to do the update slightly differently. So the uh, QKV attention allows the words to act in kind of three different senses as queries, uh, as keys, and as values. The GLOM architecture kind of uh, gets rid of this KQV attention and replaces it with, uh, with a different intuition on how we might formulate this, uh, but it's useful to know this for comparison. I'm gonna check the chat. Uh, okay. Any questions so far? How familiar is this to everyone? You can type in the chat if you have a question. Otherwise, I'll assume that everyone is at least somewhat familiar. Okay. okay. Not much knowledge, okay. Yeah, Jinwei, if there's any, um, any specific question that comes up, feel free to unmute and ask or type in the chat and ask. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll kind of keep going. So transformers also introduce this idea of multi-head attention, uh, where not only can we have objects acting differently as queries, keys, and values, uh, but the relations between the objects can also have multiple senses and we use the multiple heads of the attention mechanism kind of to represent the, uh, the multiple senses that different words can be related to each other. So instead of having just uh, calculating one similarity score between each token in the sentence and then updating the representations based on that similarity score, we calculate uh, four levels of similarity scores uh, and then use those four different attention sets of attention weights to produce um, different sections of the updated representation for each token in the input. Uh, so this allows words to be related to each other in up to four ways, up to the number of number of attention heads. And usually we do this by splitting the, the representation into different pieces so that we're not increasing the model size. We just uh, use a different attention score for different sections of the the, the token embedding. So the transformer architecture combines multi-head attention uh, with some normalization and feedforward layers. The normalization of feedforward layers are probably important, but they are um, you know, already hopefully pretty well understood. And attention is kind of the thing that distinguishes this from, uh, from other, other network architectures. Okay, so one more architecture that's referenced in this paper is capsules. I wasn't super familiar with this before, uh, before reading this article, and I'm also still not super familiar with capsules. Uh, but my understanding of capsules is that you have a kind of a feed forward layer that's partitioned into, sorry, partitioned into different chunks. 
So instead of having dense connections between everything from uh, everything from this layer into this one, can everyone see my cursor, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So instead of having dense connections from all the nodes in this layer to all the nodes in this layer, uh, we restrict the connections so that they are uh, so that only a certain slice of the network in this layer connects to uh, the corresponding slice of, of the following layer. Uh, so, and then we can use dynamic routing to adjust how much of the representation from one slice is going to adjacent slices. So in this bottom, uh, bottom right depiction, you can see that the dynamic routing um, maps from u to v with strength 0 0.9 but from u to s only with strength 0 0.1 uh, my understanding is that capsule networks have a particular algorithm like kind of a bespoke algorithm that's used to calculate this dynamic routing uh, so it adds a little bit of complexity to uh, the network network operation and uh, the hinton paper as well as some other works that are reading that i was reading on capsule networks suggests that, uh, oh yeah, nice. Suggests that max pooling is a type of dynamic routing, but Jeffrey Hinton is apparently strongly opposed to max pooling. So in max pooling, uh, if we're gonna max pool over four neurons, for example, we would have the activations from each of those neurons, and then we would only propagate the maximum value uh, to the subsequent layer, right? Which means that uh, it does depend on the activations. If you know, neuron one is the max, then neuron one's information gets propagated. If neuron two is the max, then its information gets propagated. Uh, but Jeffrey Hinton, for some reason, believes that this is kind of a crude way to do dynamic routing and suggests that there are probably superior alternatives. Uh, I think this paper is partially an attempt to correct that issue. Finally, neural fields. So, uh, Yes, yeah, so neural fields, a field in essence is a function that's defined over an input domain and a neural field represents this function with some neural network. So the field characteristics are represented by a code vector. And then in addition to the code vector, you put in some, uh, some position representation indicating where you are in the field. And then you get the field intensity essentially as the output from the, the network, the decoder. Uh, so, Let's see. Uh, okay, so the cursor is back, nice. It's occasionally disappearing, so sorry if I'm jiggling the mouse around. Uh, so we can see in this picture that we have some code vector AB. Uh, we put that into the decoder along with uh, a position X4 and then get back the function value at uh, X4. So this is FX4, F being the, the field function. So this seems a little kind of esoteric, uh, but if you think about gravity is a, an example of a field that we're all familiar with. Uh, the code vector in the case of gravity would be the mass of two objects that can be attracted to each other. The input would be the distance between the objects, and then the output would be the attraction force between the objects. So the idea is that instead of having an explicit equation like this, this is you know uh, the law of gravitational attraction, you would have a neural network learning some, some function like this. And then you put in uh, some characteristics that define the field, like the mass of the earth and the mass of the sun, for example. Uh, you also put in some input value that is uh, like a position in the field, the radius from the earth to the sun, and then you get back the, the force of the attraction. I'll pause again for questions. Okay, all right. So now, uh, now that we've heard about neural fields, transformers, uh, capsule networks, and autoencoders, we can think about the motivation for the GLOM architecture. And this has to do with part whole hierarchies. Uh, so this is a picture of a face, obviously. It's a little bit, a little bit creepy, but it also depicts a face. Uh, Kind of simply, so this is the one that I chose from Google Images. In this face, we can see that the eyelids, the eyeball, 
and the eyebrows are part of a whole that we can recognize as the eye, right? But that eye itself is part of a whole that we can represent, I mean, uh, recognize as a face, right? And this might occur in some scene that's attached to a person and we can represent the person as a whole person uh, in some, you know, scene of a room or something like that. Uh, and the idea is that humans naturally can decompose pretty much any scene uh, into a part whole hierarchy like this. We know that the chair legs belong to the chair. We know that the table legs belong to the table. We know that the chair and the table are part of like this, you know, dining room furniture setup. Uh, and yeah, the idea is to try to get a neural network to do the same thing. Current neural networks are uh, noticeably not that great at compositionality. So this is a, an approach to try to tackle that issue. Uh, yeah, so this, this depicts uh, how we can kind of segment things at different levels. So at the lower level, which is depicted right now, the eyelids, the eyebrow, the pupil, and the eyeball are different from each other. We wouldn't say that they have the same representation at this level. But at some higher level, the eye is all basically the same thing, but it's different from the nose and from the ears, right? So we might have uh, one representation that corresponds to the eye, another for the nose, and another for the ears. And the key idea for this paper is that we can represent that segmentation by islands, quote unquote, of identical vectors. Uh, so this is a figure from the paper, but I added some labels that hopefully uh, draw a connection to the face, uh, face example. So at the highest layer or one level below like the scene layer, we would have a representation for the face. And this is just, okay, one embedding for the entire face. Uh, then we can decompose this maybe into an eye and a nose. Um, and there's, you know, not enough room in this vector diagram, but we would also have one maybe for the mouth and the chin and the ears and maybe the forehead or something like that. Then the eye itself can be decomposed further into representations for the eyelashes maybe and representations for the eyeball. And then the eyelashes themselves are like eyelash one and eyelash two are slightly different from each other. And then we could do the same thing for the nose. So this horizontal axis here is essentially all the pixels in the image. It's all the locations in this scene that we're looking at. Uh, and the idea is that each location in the scene can belong to multiple levels in the hierarchy. And at each level, it gets a vector as its representation. Now we represent the hierarchy by having certain vectors uh, at certain levels being identical to each other. So if we wanna say that, you know, pixel one, pixel two, and pixel three over here are all part of the eye, then all we have to do is label them with the same vector at some level that the eye exists as kind of one concept. Uh, but they would have different representations at a lower level so that we can distinguish the eyelashes from the eyeball, uh, and, you know, et cetera. How does everyone feel about this so far? We're going to try to assign some vectors to each position in the input image. And we want to, we're going to have multiple levels of vectors. And we want similar vectors across a level to represent kind of a, a part in the hierarchy. Um, is the number of these locations a hyperparameter that we have to set during like training or something or, or inference? Or is this something like that's sort of inherent, like every sort of so on pixels, we have to sort of sample that area? Yeah, 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 yeah. it's definitely a hyperparameter. So like, uh -huh. basically everything that you could think of as a hyperparameter. Yeah, it's a hyperparameter. Uh, this network obviously is untested. Uh, he says it in the introduction that he hasn't, you know, used this on anything yet. It's just a synthesis of ideas and an architecture that seems like it would work. And this paper puts together all of his intuitions on why, why should this thing work? Why should it be superior to CapSnets or transformers or CNNs? Uh, but yeah, nobody knows exactly whether this architecture does what it, it, it's supposed to do. And uh, yeah, there are lots of hyperparameters. So the short answer to your question is uh, the simplest way to do it would be maybe one pixel is each location. So if mm -hmm. we have you know, a 10 by 10 image, we have 100 locations in the image that can each receive uh, multiple embeddings, one at each layer. Um, but yeah, we could group the, you know, group 
like four by four blocks of pixels or eight by eight blocks of pixels into their own locations if uh, one per pixel is too many. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, all right. Uh, so another idea that is related to whole part hierarchies and is motivating for this paper is the idea of coordinate transforms. So not only can humans decompose a scene into uh, different parts, right? The table legs belong to the table. We can also recognize the orientation of the table leg with respect to the table. So we establish some coordinate frame on the table then we know that the leg is, you know, on the left part of the table or on the right part of the table. Uh, and we can obtain global coordinates for positions in the scene by kind of working backwards through their coordinate transforms. So in this image right here, I have uh, a picture of a face that has its own reference frame, the big uh, blue and red axes. Then I have the eye, which itself has an intrinsic coordinate frame. Uh, but the eye is located at some translation with respect to the face, right? So we have one coordinate transform that maps from the face frame of reference to the eye frame of reference. Then finally, we might want to map the locations or sorry, indicate the locations of each eyebrow hair. Maybe you really want to know where these eyebrow hairs are at, right? Uh, and because the eye is kind of circular, maybe you want to use polar coordinates or something instead. So we have some center of the eye and then like a radius with an angle from, from uh, from the center of the eye essentially that we can use to indicate uh, indicate the location of this eyebrow hair. So if we want to know where the eyebrow hair is in the face coordinates, then we can just do the inverse transform this one and then invert this transform uh, from this, you know, this location and we'll obtain the global location for this, uh, this eyebrow hair. So the idea is that humans are actually more inclined to represent the locations of objects in a scene this way instead of using just global coordinates for everything. Um, and then I included this image up here because this is actually a popular approach in robotics. Uh, if you have a robot arm, it's pretty typical to represent the pose of the hand versus the forearm rather than representing everything in global coordinates. Um, this makes you know various calculations easier. So this is not only just for humans, but People in traditional robotics are also using it. Uh, and the idea, hopefully, is that GLOM will also learn to do the same thing, not only represent the whole part hierarchies, but also have some notion of coordinate transformations uh, between the, the frames of references for each object in the hierarchy. OK. So now we can get into the proposed architecture. So the GLOM architecture is uh, depicted this way in the paper. Uh, to start out, each one of these rectangles is a representation. You can think about an embedding, probably a vector, but I mean, there's no reason why it couldn't be, uh, you know, a matrix or something like that. But think vector when you think about each of these rectangles. Uh, the blue arrows are a neural network. The red arrows are a different neural network and the green arrows are another neural network. They could also just be the identity function depending on uh, what exactly you're doing. At certain points, he talks about uh, this being just, you know, you copy the embedding from here to here. At other times he talks about uh, maybe you have some temporal dependency or something like that. Uh, the idea is that the red arrow is a top-down neural network that takes the representation at some high level. You could think about this maybe as the face representation and maps it to a representation at some lower level, like a more specific level. Maybe this is the eye representation, for example. Um, at the same time, there is a bottom-up neural network that maps a low level representation. This could be the eyelash to a, a representation at some higher level. This could be the eye. Uh, and then finally, there's these direct mappings at the same level uh, and the idea is that these are uh, obviously recurrent connections and we do a forward pass with several iterations and these, uh, these representations at each level should eventually converge to look something like, something like this, where 
we have uh, one representation at the one representation at the face level, another representation at the eye level, and then a separate representation for the eyelashes. So this figure is showing just a single location in the image. So we actually have a stack of uh, this type of architecture. Uh, you can think about like depth wise going into the page or out of the page. Uh, and that axis represents the locations. So this is just how we represent a single location at multiple levels uh, and that the representation should evolve over time as we do um, several, like several recurrences through this network. Uh, so the paper talks about using this network on video, in which case you might have frame one, frame two, and frame three be different from each other, like actual video frames. But uh, it also focuses on just using this for images, in which case frame one, frame two, and frame three would be identical to each other. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding this. So in the paper, the author said uh, the uh, interactions between uh, all of these will only be in the adjacent nodes. Uh, like, what does that mean? Like within a level, uh, will there be interaction, like in a single level, will there be interaction between other nodes or is it only between the nodes in this layer and the other layer? I think the restriction on adjacency is not about locations, it's about levels. So only adjacent levels can inform each other. So for example, level L plus one can only inform level L and level L plus two, but it can't inform level L plus three, for example. Uh, within level L, I think uh, the interactions are allowed if I'm not wrong, correct? Yeah, within level L, then you're, if you're talking within a level, you're talking about interactions across locations. This actually is a nice segue to uh, this oh. next slide. So in this, uh, within a level, interactions across locations, I believe they are, allow they are allowed. So okay. um, at step T plus one, the representation for a particular level in a particular location uh, derives from four inputs from the previous step the blue is the prediction from the bottom up network. The red is the prediction from the top down network. Uh, the green is the representation at the same location from the previous step. And then the purple, which is not shown in the previous figure is an attention weighted uh, representation derived from uh, different locations in the same level at the previous step. So Sai, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, we can't get information from like level L plus two down to here, but we can get information from different locations to, to this one. Okay, got it, thanks. Any questions about, about this? Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Why the here the blue line, um, the bottom up net and the red line, the top down net, they have the uh, same direction from the from left to right. I I was thinking like bottom up will be uh, another way, uh, reverse way uh, compared to the top down net. Mm. It, it, mm. Do 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 you know what I mean? Like. Uh, for example, the bottom down, uh, bottom up net uh -huh. is from left the level uh, level L to no not L to some level to the upper level or lower level, and then the bottom up will be the reverse direction. But here is uh, they use the arrow with the same direction. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused for this figure. Yeah, so I drew this figure. So if it's confusing, that's my fault. Don't don't blame the <laughs> don't blame the paper. Uh, yeah, so I see I see what you're asking. I think I understand the question. Um, okay, so let's see. In this figure, we're just looking at what happens at one location. 
right? So actually the direction question I think applies to this figure also, even without considering like different multiple locations. So we're just looking at one spot in the image, right? Maybe this is a spot on the eyeball within a face uh, that happens to be in the eyebrows, for example, right? And we're trying to derive something that looks like, like this for that location, right? So we want one vector at a higher level of abstraction, one vector at like slightly less abstraction, one vector at like even lower abstraction, and one vector that is very specific. So this vertical axis in this figure corresponds to the vertical axis in this figure. We want to obtain a like a face. Sorry, the cursor is driving me nuts. A uh, face embedding, like a, an eye embedding, and then like an eyelash embedding here. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, yes. OK. So then the way that we do this is by applying the bottom up and top down transformations in recurrent fashion over and over. So we would start off with these embeddings, maybe randomly initialized, and then apply the bottom up net and apply the top down net, saying, OK, the uh, the thing at this layer should have some hierarchical relationship to the thing at this layer and to the thing at this layer, right? And by uh, applying this, this transformation over and over and over again, the idea is that eventually we will converge to something that, that looks like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you are right. I see. Does that yes. answer the question? Yes. OK. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, really good question. Thank you. Will these transformations bottom up slash top down be applied in parallel? Uh, is this computable in parallel? I'm not sure. I don't recall from the paper whether uh, whether that was discussed or not. Maybe somebody remembers. Uh, to me, it seems like they probably could be computed in parallel uh, because if you have, yeah, I th I th I don't think there's anything really preventing the uh, the parallel computation of the top down and bottom up bottom up networks. So each of these, like the red arrow and the blue arrow, are uh, they're each their own neural network, and you're applying them on assuming that you have all of the representations at the previous step right across the level. Then you could compute the top down mapping from L plus one to L and the bottom up mapping from L minus one to L at the same time. The only thing that needs to be synchronous, I think, is the fusion of the green arrow, the red arrow, and the blue arrow, basically. Like when you combine the uh, elements one, two, three, and four from this slide, uh, obviously you need to know their values to be able to combine them. Hopefully that answers the question on parallelism. Okay, all right, so uh, the paper suggests doing this combination using a weighted geometric mean rather than a simple average. Uh, you know, bonus points to anybody who can, just kidding, I can't assign bonus points, I don't run the class, but bonus points to anybody who can recall from the paper why it's a weighted geometric mean and not an average. Uh, this escaped me while I was reading it. So if anyone has the answer to that, that would be, I would be curious to know. Uh, so the idea for the GLOM training is that we're going to train the whole architecture as a masked autoencoder. So we should be able to put in the, uh, the pixel representation to each of these positions, uh, sorry, each of these locations in the image at each level, uh, do this propagation, and then at the output be able to reconstruct the original image. So uh, obviously this island learning thing, like learning to produce identical vectors at each layer to represent parts, uh, it won't happen without some extra encouragement, right? Uh, just, just having a, an autoencoder doesn't automatically give you that whole part hierarchy. So the way that we try to get the architecture to produce that part whole hierarchy is by enforcing agreement between the top down prediction and the bottom up prediction. That is that uh, this prediction coming from the red arrow and the prediction coming from the blue arrow uh, should be the same um, 
when they when they join here. So we penalize the network if these two differ from each other greatly. Uh, so of course we want islands with similar vectors to represent the parts at a level, uh, but we could, and we could encourage the vectors to be similar to nearby vectors, but we don't want the vector representations to be too similar because we're gonna use their differences to distinguish between parts at a level. Uh, so if we apply this, these, these regularizers too strongly, right? The agreement between the, the top-down prediction and the bottom-up prediction, if we make these too strong, then the network will just say, okay, you want everything to be the same. I'll make everything the same, right? And then the representations uh, will be identical throughout, throughout the layer, which is not what we want because then we can't distinguish between the parts. Um, so this phenomenon is referred to as collapse, right? Collapse is bad, we don't want that to happen. Uh, the proposed solution is to allow the representations to attend to each other freely within a level uh, and penalize the dissimilarity based on the attention score. So instead of forcing all of the uh, all of the representations at different locations to be similar to neighboring representations, we allow some differences based on the attention score. So the idea is that all of the pixels or all of the representations at the eye level uh, that correspond to the eye location in the image will all attend to each other, and then they'll all end up having the, the same embedding. But they, they won't attend to other pixels that are in the ear, for example. So, but there will be no penalty on the difference between the eye embedding and the ear embedding uh, because the attention scores are, are focused on like eye to eye locations. So the idea here is that uh, by allowing basically by only penalizing differences in the representations based on the attention score, by having these islands of identical vectors, uh, you can incur almost no error uh, under that penalization scheme. Uh, so the hope is that you could avoid collapse, right? You could avoid getting just identical representations without having to do contrastive learning. Uh, but if this doesn't work, then the fallback solution would be contrastive learning where you would force the learned representations to be different for different images or different for uh, different patches of the same image, for example. Okay, so uh, learning whole part hierarchies was kind of one part of the goal. And then the second part of the goal, the motivation was to learn coordinate transforms. Uh, so there, there are a couple quotes from the paper. I think these are actually hopefully not too confusing. Uh, so suppose that we would like the pose of a part to be represented by a vector that is a subsection of the embedding vector representing the part. So what does that mean? Uh, imagine that we're looking at a position in the image that corresponds to the eye, right? Uh, and this is the eye embedding. Now we have all kinds of information in here about like what color is the eye and, you know, is it is it uh, you know cat eye shape or like human eye shape? Uh, but part of this representation should include the position for the eye. We want to be able to know where is it with respect to ourselves looking at the scene. The same way that if I'm looking at you, I see your eye, and I I can you know if if <laughs> I could reach out and touch it, that would be weird. But like I know where it is uh, with respect to myself. So we want to have some eye position in some global coordinate frame, basically. Uh, as part of the embedding for each, each part in the hierarchy. Uh, so the idea is that GLOM should learn to do this uh, by making part of this top-down network a coordinate transform. So if we know the position of the face, the idea is that this network will apply the coordinate transform uh, from the face to get the position of the eye in that face. Uh, and the idea is that GLOM should have to know how to do this based on this fusion that's happening at this layer. So for me to be able to just take the average of all of these different uh, part embeddings uh, and have that be a representation at layer L at the next time step, uh, I need to know 
how this object is oriented. So the paper gives an example of mistaking a square with no rotation and a diamond with a uh, 45 degree rotation for each other, right? These are in indistinguishable, but if the square and the diamond have different semantics, then your, uh, your representation that's based on knowing that there's a square in the image uh, will be wrong if it's actually a diamond, right? So the idea is that uh, Glom should be forced to learn the, uh, uh, the positions of objects uh, or the poses of objects in, in the scene to be able to use them appropriately uh, to represent other things in the scene. This is a little, a little kind of uh, de definitely confusing. Like it was hard for me to understand when I first approached it. And I feel like my explanation just now was maybe not super straightforward. So if anybody has any questions, do not be afraid to ask. Okay, no, no questions on the coordinate transforms. All right. <laughs> okay, so the paper makes some connection to neural fields. Uh, so really, we've we've seen the majority of the GLOM architecture now. Like this is this is basically what it's about. Uh, you have the top-down network. You have the bottom-up network. You have some attention-based fusion across locations, and then you have propagation directly from the same location. Uh, in the same layer. And we're gonna try to learn these islands of identical vectors to segment the image. And also those vectors should include something that represents the pose. Uh, and we should learn that pose automatically because the it's, it's easier to fuse information from objects if we know what their pose is. Okay, so the connection to neural fields, uh, the paper makes this claim, connection, you know, intuition, that GLOM is actually a hierarchy of neural fields. So if we wanted to represent an image as a single neural field, we could have a code vector representing the image. Uh, the code vector should kind of contain the image semantics. And then we would put in these locational arguments to the field. And then we would get back the pixel intensities at every location in the image, right? So if my code vector is saying this is, you know, a, a scene with a face in it, then position, you know, one one, position one two, position one three, etc., all the way to position, you know, uh, ten twenty four by ten twenty four, should give me the pixel intensities at every location in that image. Uh, but this is inefficient if we, if our images tend to be composed of familiar objects. Uh, like faces or eyes or people. Uh, so instead of having just one neural field that represents everything, uh, we have a hierarchy of neural fields that can reuse those familiar objects. So the idea is strongly related to the coordinate transforms from the last slide. But the idea is that uh, the top-down network is acting sort of as a face field, like a, a mapping from the face representation plus a location to a representation for some subcomponent in the face, right? Then this one, if we apply the top-down network again, uh, we have this code vector representing the semantics of the eye. We pass in a location and the location has to do with the fact that we're in this column, in this location in the image. And then we get back a representation at the lowest layer. So at the very bottom, we should obtain the pixel intensities, right? At the very lowest, uh, lowest representational level. Uh, but you can see that we're applying like a hierarchy of neural fields rather than just one single neural field across the entire image. And the idea is that this will be more efficient than trying to learn a neural field that can represent just any image um, from, from a single code vector. Okay, all right. So then the author makes some comparisons to existing networks um, in comparison to transformers. Uh, instead of having different weights at every layer of the transformer, like in a BERT architecture, for example, you have different weights at each layer. 
uh, the GLOM architecture uses the same weights at every layer. So the top-down network and the bottom-up network are reused. In a separate section of the paper, uh, the author actually says that you might have different networks for each of those, but it's not a strict requirement and it's not, it's not the default as it is in a transformer style architecture. Uh, another difference is that instead of using query key value attention uh, for query key value attention this way and this way, uh, we, just use, we just use simple attention. And the idea with this is that, um, my understanding of this is that it has to do kind of with the combinatorics of the, of the situation. So if at level L, for example, we might be talking about this being the eye, this being the nose, this being the ear, and this being the chin, right? And if we wanna do query key value attention, uh, we might want to know how a nose can act as a query for an eye or how a nose can act as a query for the chin or how a nose can act as a query for the ears, right? So we end up with uh, this pairwise, pairwise combinations of uh, queries and keys, right? So we have, let's say we have, you know, four elements that we wanna do this QKV attention on, we would end up having, you know, four squared uh, sets of queries and keys, or we could see four, four squared sets of queries and keys being useful. Uh, and obviously that kind of uh, exponential number of, uh, number of queries and keys maybe is not the best. So instead of doing that, all of these, uh, these objects at this level are going to contribute to uh, bottom up and top down uh, top down representations at the, the level above. So for example, the eye, the, uh, the nose, the chin and the ears, for example, are all trying to inform a face representation at the higher level. So uh, because they're all trying to inform the face, we can just have them all try to predict some face vector. That's what the bottom up network is doing. Uh, it's not super easy to see in this figure because uh, I don't have this blue vector replicated, but, or sorry, blue network replicated, but this blue bottom up network is going to be applied here, 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 and here to try to produce a face representation. And those representations from, like we saw in this one, should be identical, right? The eye and the nose, by applying the bottom up network to each of these, we should produce this same identical face vector. So coming back to the combinatorics, this means that we only really need to produce uh, one, one face representation. You can think of this as like one query slash key uh, for each object in the lower level. So it's uh, linear with respect to the number of objects instead of uh, you know, a squared, squared uh, complexity with respect to the number of objects. Uh, I thought that was really interesting, but also kind of like dense, first of all, hard to understand, and also a little bit speculative. Um, but yeah, an interesting point. Uh, instead of having multiple heads, as we have in the transformer architecture, we have multiple levels. Uh, and here, the multiple levels, the interactions are only possible for adjacent levels, instead of the heads being able to react, uh, interact um, in any direction with each other. And then finally, the bottom up and top down networks perform coordinate transforms, hopefully, which uh, doesn't necessarily occur in transformer networks, or at least not, you know, maybe, maybe you can get a transformer network to do that, but it takes some extra manipulation. The paper also compares the GLOM architecture to capsule networks. So in capsule networks, each capsule represents one part at a level, uh, and the Kind of the downside to this is that you can't have soft membership of certain parts of the image to certain capsules. It's like this capsule either is gonna represent the eyes or the nose, uh, but that's it, right? Uh, instead in GLOM, the part identity is continuous. So locations can kind of choose which part of the image they wanna be a part of uh, just by modifying their, their representation at a certain level. GLOM also uh, gets rid of the need for dynamic routing. Uh, the connection strength from, uh, from this part to another part 
uh, is handled kind of automatically by this, this attention-based mechanism at the same layer. It also gets rid of the need for EM clustering. To be honest, I don't know what, what the role of EM clustering is in capsule networks, but um, this step and this step apparently are you know, slightly complicated and in theory, GLOM should be able to totally you know, do both of them at the same time uh, without the need for like explicit extra steps. Uh, and one potential, all of these are seen as positives. The author says that the highly distributed shape representations for GLOM may not be a positive in comparison to CAPSNETs. So because CAPSNETs, uh, each capsule corresponds explicitly to a part, right? Like this is the eyes, this is the nose, this is the mouth. Uh, you only need to look at this, uh, you know, relatively dense and low dimensional representation to determine everything you need to know about the eyes, including their shape, right? But in the, uh, in the GLOM architecture, the shape of an object is dictated by basically how many embeddings have you know, the same orientation. So we can only determine what is the shape of the eye by basically looking at uh, all the vectors that look like this in a particular layer of the network. So uh, we have to do this kind of like draw the boundary around all these identical vectors to determine what is actually the shape of the eye. Uh, it's not exactly clear like why that's why that's a bad thing or how you know a, a denser representation is is better unless you have some task that depends on uh, object detection or image segmentation for example maybe you don't want to have have to compute over all the embeddings in the image to figure out where exactly is the bus in this in this intersection or where is the neighboring car something like that uh, finally, some limitations for the GLOM architecture. Obviously, it's not proven yet, right? It's a, it's a proposed architecture. Um, I think maybe the discreteness of the levels is one of the remaining discrete things that is not learned. So it's not so much that I, I can immediately see that this is going to be a weakness. It's just like this paper tries to make, um, make a lot of things that are discrete in capsule networks uh, learned automatically through gradient descent in the GLOM architecture. But the one thing that isn't learned is the fact that, that we have these discrete levels, right? So we have propagation from, um, sorry, we have propagation from level L plus one to level L, but level L plus one and level L are distinct, like by design. Uh, so I could see it maybe being useful to have some kind of like soft level membership uh, that something can belong to uh, a part at one level and a part at another level, but it's, it's not entirely clear. Like, for example, if I'm sitting in a room with a chair with some wheels, like a desk chair, um, and I look down and I look at the chair and I see like, I'm, I'm wearing sandals, right? So I'll, I'll look down and I'll see my toes. Uh, is the wheel at the same level as my toe? Is it at the same level as my toenail, right? Uh, the fact that we have these discrete levels and we're trying to force everything into them, uh, maybe it's a weakness. If, if our stance is that we should try and learn everything end to end through gradient descent, then it could be a weakness. Uh, and then final finally, this thing seems difficult to train. There are many, many hyperparameters. Everywhere you look, there's a hyperparameter. And, uh, yeah, I'd be I'd be surprised if it you know works the first time around, right? So probably there will be sensitivity to hyperparameters and you know training instabilities and those sorts of things. Uh, but we'll see, right? That remains to be proven. So that's it for uh, kind of the structured part of my presentation for today. I was hoping that we could have uh, kind of a discussion on on the details. Uh, yeah, David is asking, do you know how far along they are in implementing this paper in real life? I do not know. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. As of early last year, it was just a concept, um, but I'm not sure what the status is currently. I have a question relating to like the coordinate system. What I still don't understand why it's like important to have like a literal like uh, positioning system inbuilt like a network. I mean, I understand the uh, initial idea of having like trees and like that's how humans supposedly uh, parse images, right? We go from 
uh, smaller components all the way up to the larger scene. Yeah. Uh, like the entire like idea of forcing things to also tell us about their position in an image is like, if I don't want that information for like some task or in my embedding, uh, what's like the sort of main benefit in doing that? Yeah, uh, the times that I've listened to Jeffrey Hinton speak, his, it seems like his motivation is mostly figuring out like how does how do, does the human brain do things, right? And uh, that's why he's citing a lot of neuroscience literature. Uh, so I guess maybe his his motivation would be that okay, it's obvious that the human brain can figure this out. So how can we get a network to figure it out? Not so much that we need it for every single task. I agree with you. Probably in some tasks, it's not really necessary at all. Uh, I think it comes from kind of a curiosity perspective, like, can we get a network to do this? And noting that the existing neural networks are not so good at it, right? Like we can't represent the uh, the pose of objects in the scene hierarchically. Like this is the pose in the eye coordinate frame, but also in the face coordinate frame and also in the person coordinate frame. I see. And just uh, one follow-up uh, question is like, there was a section in the paper that said, oh, this is all of this is biologically impossible, like not plausible or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I read that section incorrectly or something, but like if you, if, and even like the first sentence is like, there's strong um, evidence. He's not, it's not like proven or anything. It's like a lot of this, even the biological ideas, there's yeah. like not a lot of proof to sort of like support them. They're just like general assumptions that he's sort of made. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think what happens is you start you start out thinking, okay, how does the brain work? And then you you try to build this architecture that mimics some functionality. And then it starts working for practical applications. And then you go in a rabbit hole with that for a little bit. And then eventually, you know, five years later, you come back to the brain. So I think that's another case of what's going on here. Um, like he started out with, okay, the brain can do uh, compositional, you know, whole part hierarchies and the brain can do like pose estimation in various reference frames. Uh, how could we get a network to do that? And then it turns out that the network that he came up with uh, isn't necessarily, doesn't meet some other biological criteria, right? Like it doesn't meet criteria on, uh, I think efficiency is one of the big ones, right? Like uh, if you had to do this with actual neurons, you would have like a way larger brain than we have. So maybe that's not how the brain is actually doing it. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that sort of answers it. I don't know if you have any further, further comments on that. No, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah I have a follow up comment for the first question on the coordinated on the system in this paper. I think this idea is probably a follow up idea from a capsulate. So in the capsulate, they propose the idea, I mean, to use the vector to represent both the existence of some patterns, also the direction of the patterns. So before, I mean, for conventional CE model, we can know if we have a pattern existing or not, but we don't care about direction or the orientation at all. However, if we have a vector, actually for the vector, we have two properties. One is the length of the, of the vector. We already know the direction or the orientation of the vector. So in the capsule, they try to use the length of a vector to denote the existing probability or score of some patterns. They also use the direction of the vector to denote the orientation or the, or the direction of the patterns at the same time. So probably this idea is a flow of idea from capsulate, and they want to incorporate the coordinate system into a regular or general neural nets. I mean, they, so they can represent both the existence, probability scores, also the orientation of the patterns. Yeah, that's, that's all from, from my comments for the question on the coordinate system in this paper. Thank you. Yeah, any more questions? Wait, so it adds, so adding these, uh, uh, like from, from the capsule net um, idea, so when we add these, uh, this extra information about the direction of the patterns, um, this sort of adds to the performance of, of some model because the, now there's more information that can be used to sort of, for the neural network to uh, differentiate different things. And like, let's say in a classification task, uh, now we have more information on the sort of the directionality of something. Uh, our, our model will be able to better like separate things. Is that the main idea then? 
if we add the orientation is information into the presentation, then I mean, this model will be more robust. For example, if for the conventional like CA model, if we rotate the image slightly, then we can never mm. different representations, right? Because yeah. we ignore the orientation information. However, when it comes to capsule light, if we incorporate orientation information in the, in the representation, then if we rotate the input image slightly, then we can still learn the same representation generally, because we can capture orientation by the model itself. This is the main motivation for capsule for, for, for detecting this kind of orientation information in the in the in the representations. So it will be more robust. It can achieve better performance for some of the scenarios. If we rotate images, we can still know this one is for human, this one is for animal, for example. So it will be more robust. I see. All right, that, that clears a lot. Thank you. Yes. Just a, a very quick follow-on on that. I think the uh the invariance to pose essentially probably could lead to better parameter efficiency. Like you don't need uh, extra parameters to represent this object in this pose and then the same object in another pose uh, if you understand that this object is actually the same thing just in different poses. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, any more questions for, for this paper? I have a question. Also, as you listed out uh, about the discrete levels, so I'm quite, uh, yeah, it is qu not quite clear to me that if any design in this paper is for like specifically to um, to allow GLOM to learn the different hierarchies, because uh, as I see for the training um, objective, uh, it kind of not allow the architecture to do that, right? Or what's your thought on this one? Mm. Could could you elaborate a little? Yeah, because I think for training objectives, they only that like for the bottom up and the top down uh, supervision, they uh, like the both directions will be penalized if they have if they're not uh, the same, right? So um, doesn't that kind of enforce GLOM to learn like for all hierarchies they will generate somehow similar representations mm, yeah uh so I, I think the question i guess to rephrase it to check if i understand you uh it sounds like because we're penalizing discrepancies between the top-down prediction and the bottom of prediction at each level uh and there's nothing really different from you know level layer one versus layer two versus layer three then uh, how can we expect this to learn some hierarchy? I think most likely uh, you would vary the strength of the regularizers at each level so that you allow slightly more difference between representations at the bottom level and then uh, stronger regularization, meaning stronger agreement um, at the second level and then even stronger agreement at the top level such that you get this kind of like, uh, you know, gradient of specificness or gradient of of resolution, like the more difference you have between the vectors uh, at a particular level, the more resolution you have in the hierarchy, right? Like you're at a more detailed level in the hierarchy. So I would assume you would have to relax the regularizers at the top to get like one kind of one, or sorry, increase the strength of the regularizers at the top to get one shared representation and then relax them at the bottom so that you can have differences. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm curious for other people's answers to that one also, and a great question. Yeah, yeah, that's what, uh, yes. Um, yeah, and also I have another question, like a follow up question is that um, if they kind of like just uh, free the regularizer a bit, like along different uh, levels, but uh, it is learned, like the design is for it to learn by the autoencoder, right? So, how is that, um, how is this layer clear? Well, just in the beginning. Uh, you mean like why, why would they use an autoencoder style training or? Mm, yeah, because I think for using autoencoder, uh, if the if uh, because I imagine they will have like a random initial because we don't have the embedding right uh, yet. So in the beginning, so um, I was curious that if the hierarchy is not yeah, it's uh, the hierarchy is definitely learned along the way. Uh -huh. So yeah, how is the level will be, uh, can be learned even if we uh, adjust the regularizer 
for different levels, how can they still be learned? Because in the beginning, we still don't have the hierarchy information, right? Yeah, uh, I don't know if I grasp the question totally. I think the idea is that you would have uh, at time zero, uh, either the image input data, of course the image input data needs to make it into the network somehow, right? So uh, probably, so we're looking at a single location in this figure. I would assume that the pixel information at this location is part of what goes to the representation at all these different levels at, at time zero. Uh, and then maybe you have some, some random, random jitter or something like that um, to get them to be slightly different from each other at the beginning. Uh, and then you have different regularization strengths as you go up and down the hierarchy. Um, and then by, performing these forward passes, ideally you would get that kind of like island behavior uh, with more specificity at this level based on having weaker regularization at this level. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, there are interesting you know, arguments in the paper, but I'm not like 100% convinced that, that it would work to do the thing that it claims to do. Uh, any, any more kind of comments? Did I even, did I even get your question correct? Uh, yes, yes, this is actually my question. So yeah, that's just the uh, point. I I don't, I don't, I, yeah, it, it is not quite clear to me. So yeah, because I guess uh, it also goes back to, it is not a proven idea yet. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Mohammed's in the chat. Uh, <laughs> this idea is so good, why doesn't it work yet? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, um, based on how excited Jeffrey Hinton was a year ago, I'm sure that he's probably either, either it's like totally failed and he's doing something else or, uh, still working on trying to get it to work. Um, and yeah, I mean, some ideas take a long time to materialize, I guess. Um, uh, I don't know. That's a good question though. I would expect to see something in the next couple of years, hopefully if this, uh, if this works. Yeah, Bear says it probably doesn't work. <laughs> I think the value of this paper really uh, beyond just proposing this architecture that, you know, oh yeah, this will be the new transformers or this will be the new caps nets. I think drawing the intuitions across all of these kind of recent developments um, is is really useful. Like the, and the connections to like neuroscience I think are pretty interesting and useful. Um, even if GLOM proves to not work, uh, how we can see GLOM as an instance of like transformers or an instance of neural fields or an instance of, uh, of capsules. I think having that all put together in one kind of succinct, um, somewhat succinct article is nice. So yeah, even if it doesn't work, I'm glad I read this, I guess is what I'm saying. Any other questions? Yeah, any more questions? This is not an easy paper. You should have tons of questions, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so if we have no other questions, then probably that's it for today. And the talk is really good, and it illustrates many of the, I mean, it makes many of the parts of the paper clear for us. And also, let's thank the speaker, I mean, for today. And uh, so, uh, yeah, if you are interested in some other paper in a caption later, you can refer to the reference list. We have the paper prepared for you as well in the reference list. Yeah, so thanks so much, Gabriel. And so, I mean, the, I mean, the talk is very good. Thanks for now. Thanks, everyone. I enjoyed the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Yeah. By the way, so in the next week, we will have two other papers. The presenters will be Zhuo Han, right? And the Jia Bei, right? So please, please read the papers, I mean, before class, or to prepare for the, the slides. And then, I mean, you can share with the uh, with, uh, with TS. So we can, I mean, so share with them in, in, in the schedule spreadsheet. Okay, so that's it for today. And thanks for your time.